Sí, hola, hola a todos, eh, buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos a esta actividad y al Museo de Reina Sofía. Esta actividad, en cierta manera, pues es especial ya que da comienzo a un nuevo formato de, de charlas que denominamos conversaciones, que lo que intenta es eh, precisamente complementar el resto de la programación de, de debate del museo, los seminarios y los encuentros que realizamos en relación a a las exposiciones o a la colección o a la, nuestras líneas de trabajo. Las conversaciones intentan ser justo lo contrario, es decir, el, pues, eh, debates que, que, que nos interesan, que son relevantes, pero que, que en cierta forma pues, eh, no están dentro de nuestro campo de trabajo más inmediato ¿no? y que suceden en su mayor parte fuera de, del museo y que nosotros, pues, acogemos e incentivamos y que buscamos que también pues, retroalimenten ¿no? nuestra propia investigación. En este caso, pues, eh, dar las gracias a, a la Embajada de, de Estados Unidos, al, eh, el, eh, también al Departamento de, de Estado, en el, el programa Art in Embassies de Washington, eh, por hacer posible pues, esta, esta conversación y haber traído a a Thelma Golden, a Thiester Gates y a, y a Glenn Ligon. El, pensábamos que era un momento este muy interesante para volver a plantear las, el debate en torno a las políticas de, de identidad, a la representación de la diferencia en el arte reciente eh, norteamericano, porque es, eh, es crucial de cara pues, a ciertas exposiciones determinantes el, el año pasado, que planteaban genealogías más extensas dentro del campo de la, de la performance, incluso eh, dentro del campo de la masculinidad, pero que planteaban digamos, recorridos que iban desde los años 50 hasta, hasta hoy, pues con una ambición, con una amplitud y con, una, con un nivel de, de investigación bastante eh, relevante para, para digamos, articular un contramodelo que iba más allá de figuras individuales muy aisladas, que era más o menos pues, como hasta ahora se venía presentando la, la cuestión de la diferencia en las prácticas eh, recientes. Nos pareció también muy relevante pues, eh, por el trabajo cruzar artistas de diferentes generaciones. En el caso de Glenn Ligon, que él ya estuvo aquí en la exposición de Manhattan, Mix Use, que comisario Douglas Cream junto a Lynn Cook pues el, tiene que ver con todo el trabajo de artistas pues como Adrián Piper, René Green, de trabajar el vocabulario del arte conceptual desde ese sujeto de la, de la diferencia excluido. El, muy diferente al, al trabajo de Theaster Gates, que es otra generación más joven, pero también que tiene que ver con cosas que han pasado en el museo, pues el, eh, toda la tradición de la Escuela Realista de Chicago, eh, comprometida con la comunidad, eh, León Golub, o con Kerry James Marshall, que también estuvo aquí, también en este auditorio presentando hace poco. Y en el caso de Ciaster, pues eh, trabajando desde la performance, desde la cultura material, vernacular. Y bueno, pues qué mejor que Thelma Golden pues, para conducir esta conversación. Ella es la directora del Estudio Museum de Harlem, la Chief Curator también, desde el año 2000. Y es eh, quizá pues, casi, digamos que... Mmm, pues se ha realizado un trabajo ejemplar en recorridos, exposiciones amplias, temáticas y también pues, en proyectos seminales pues, con, con, con Glenn Ligon, con Cara Walker, con Carrie Mae Wentz y con tantos otros artistas, casi eh, Lorna Simpson, en fin, eh, casi todos, eh, siempre tra trabajando en la cuestión de la, eh, de la diferencia. ¿no? Y nada más, pues darles la bienvenida y tendremos una conversación de una hora más o menos. Y luego pues abrimos a las preguntas. Así que gracias cuando queráis. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. It is a great pleasure to be here with Glenn Ligon and Theaster Gates and to have the opportunity to talk to them about their work. As was said, I'm Thelma Golden, director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, which is a museum devoted to presenting the work of black artists from around the world. We were founded in 1968, and our mission and mandate has always been to look at the ways in which the history of art has been impacted by the work of artists of African descent. The museum, which is on 125th Street, just a block away from the Apollo Theater, is 
uh, devoted to the collecting of work, but also the presentation. And it's been my great pleasure as a curator to work with both of these artists in many different forms and a thrill today to get to talk to them. So what we thought we would do first is each of them are going to introduce a bit about their work, their practice, some thoughts about what inspires the work, and then we are going to have a conversation which really looks at some of the shared themes um, between these two artists, as well as some of the many ideas that they're important and powerful work provokes. So we're going to begin with the Astor Gate. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, as Chema said, um, my, my work is rooted in Chicago. Um, over the last 10 or 15 years, I found myself thinking about art in maybe what used to be three buckets. One, one bucket was about um, object making. Um, how could an artist say what he or she wanted to by presenting the world in a kind of smaller form? Uh, that I could respond to the world with objects and it would be kind of a, a symbolic interpretation of, of how the world worked. I often um, would use kind of object making and especially ceramics in my youth to, to try to convey things, but also just to um, get better at making forms. Um, the second way of working was, was um, not only thinking about objects, but like how um, performance might uh, have an impact in the world. Like if there were things that I wanted to say and I felt I couldn't say them through object making, could a speech act or a song or um, a theatrical moment in a public space uh, be the right response, a letter to the mayor, a letter to the president. So they were more kind of symbolic and performative gestures. And then there are moments when um, I'm thinking about a problem in the world and the best way to think about that problem is to try to address the problem in the world. And that sometimes even if I fail in uh, resolving the problem, the artistic intervention is that one would fight against the world best they can and see what happens. And so the work that um, you see uh, behind us is uh, this combination of thinking about objects and labor, thinking about the relationship between objects and the real world, and sometimes the way that objects allow for um, me to perform those objects and leave traces of those things. This in one way constitutes for me what I think of as an artistic practice. And the more that I play around with these varying forms, the more complicated my interest in object making becomes interventions in the real world and performance. So that they become hard maybe to even distinguish sometimes as works of art. start rolling. Yeah. Um, I would say that I started out as a painter. I was very interested in the generations of painters in the 50s, uh, called themselves abstract expressionists. Uh, Jackson Pollock, uh, Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein. And so that was my basis. Uh, but then found uh, as a young artist that the vocabulary of abstraction that I was trying to work in couldn't contain all of the things that I was interested in, couldn't contain, as the actor said, the world. <laughs> uh, and so the practice changed to incorporate language. And that was because there were these amazing texts I was reading by Jean Genet, Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, Gertrude Stein, but no way to get those ideas from those texts into the paintings that I was making, except at a certain moment, I realized that if I just put the text into the paintings and made the text the paintings, that was a way of uh, channeling the power of those texts, but also um, being committed to painting as an act. Um, so the first works were dealing very much with language, uh, dealing with questions of visibility and invisibility, uh, dealing with uh, formal issues around repetition um, and, the, and surface, uh, 
Um, and then the practice expanded out from that, uh, thinking about literature or text as a source more generally. So some of the work you see, like behind me, The Death of Tom, is a film that I made that's based on uh, the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, but is a very abstract film. Um, it's based in literature, but it takes another form beyond painting. Um, the images here uh, are from a march in Washington maybe 20 years ago called the Million Man March. Again, about issues of representation and visibility, which has always been part of the, the painting practice, but expanded out to start to use images. Um, and then expanding into neon more recently, um, and really thinking of neon as sculpture. Um, so moving somewhat beyond the painting practice to objects that hang in space. Um, using Gertrude Stein as the Negro sunshine here. Um, uh, using the word America as a sort of thing to play with in these various forms. Um, and then um, more recent text work is moving towards music and thinking about music as a source material. And so this body of work that you see behind me was based on Steve Reich, a composition called Come Out, which was from 1966. And the composition was made in response to a call that Reich got to make a piece for a benefit for a group of kids that were arrested falsely over murder in Harlem in 1964. And Steve Reich takes their testimony and makes this tape loop piece using one of the kids' words. And I got very inspired by that piece because so much of my work has been about speech, uh, repetition, and so the Reich sort of made sense to me, but also that the Steve Reich was in response to a very specific social moment, uh, police brutality in Harlem at a particular moment. And those issues, given American history, are still quite relevant. And so a lot of, I think, my work also dives into the archive of American history and brings forward moments from the past to the present and tries to think about how those moments from the past echo in the present. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks. Um, what's amazing to me is that there are so many places um, where both of your work converges um, together. And I wanted to start and talk about the fact that both of you are deeply invested in this idea of history. Glenn, you've taken on history in this sort of broadest way, looked at these historic moments, mm -hmm. and, and documented, but also, in many cases, commented on them in your work. And you have actually also done that, but at the same time, you've looked at history sometimes through a personal lens, right? Through autobiography. So my first question to you, Glenn, in talking about this idea of history, how the moments that you have chosen to look at in your work, mm -hmm. moments like the Million Man March or the Central Park jogger case. How do you pick a moment mm -hmm. and consider it as something that you want to make art about? Right. I would say that the moments are picked um, in a strange way, in uh, uh, very personally. Do they know? pick you for the <laughs> moments? In of? some ways, in some ways. Um, even though they may have happened you know, before I was born, there's a, a sense that these things are quite tangible mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the way the work starts is, you know, say I did a, an installation based on the history of slavery, a particular slave mm -hmm. narrative. And really that started from me going to the library and doing research on images from slavery and finding one image. Mm -hmm and saying, oh, that's just a strange image. What does this image mean? And doing more research about it and then developing a body of work out of it. Or in terms of the images with the hands you saw from the Million Man March, just thinking about the images of in the newspaper that surrounded that march. Mm -hmm. A march in Washington, D.C., organized by the Nation of Islam, about the visibility of black people in the United States. And I'm just thinking about those images and realizing 
we've had those marches before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very ironic that for people that have been in the United States from the beginning, we still have this need mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. gather and show that we're visible here. And so, you know, that the sort of poignancy of that moment kind of really struck me. And I think that's it too. Uh, they're poignant for me, you know, mm -hmm. they, they resonate that way yeah. emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so that prompts a kind of further investigation. And for you, Theaster, mm -hmm. it seems that this engagement in history really is what takes you to thinking about the archive. Mm -hmm. And I think, for example, <coughs> about the work that you've been making for many years <coughs> using the material of the archive of the Johnson Publishing Company, which was a publishing company established in the United <coughs> States by an African-American family which published magazines, significantly Ebony and Jet magazine, which documented the history and the culture mm. of African-Americans. And can mm. you talk a bit about the history that comes from the archive and the way in which you've reclaimed sure. an archive through art? Sure, so maybe I can say first, um, the more that I think about my history as a, as a, as a ceramic artist and, and the vessel as a kind of necessary um, point of departure for sculpture, I often feel empty. I feel like my art practice is like a emptiness. And um, in some ways, the archive became a way of like filling myself up and then saying, well, um, for the next 20 years, I could, I could dig into this thing, and where I'm uh, uh, an empty vessel, let's say, um, my, my big work will be to care for these things that are now in my house, right, so now inside me. And so in some ways, um, by uh, identifying the Johnson Collection and kind of understanding that it's an important moment, like again, it, it kind of found me, but in finding me, it also, you know, it needed care. Mm -hmm. And so, so a big part of archival uh, work is about caring for things. Mm -hmm. So that felt really good, that, that I would have a set of objects that could allow me to care for them almost like a garden. Mm -hmm. And that in that, it would produce or yield all these possibilities that were way too many possibilities for me myself. And so uh, in addition to me caring for it, I could also have other artists thinking with me about the Johnson Collection or thinking with me about um, Frankie Knuckles' albums collection, like, like this, this house music DJ in Chicago. Because if I'm excited about a certain pact with history, then other people might be too. And so in some cases, um, like these images of Ebony and Jet, uh, and the same with the literature that, that Glenn thinks about, these things are right below our noses. But they're just below enough that we would never open the book again. We would never read the poem out loud. We would never go back to that issue of Ebony. And so one part of the work is simply, simply lifting it up, cleaning it off, making it tangible again, or maybe inserting yourself as an artist just a little bit so that people see it in a new way. Fantastic. Materials, what mm. you make your art from. Mm profoundly interesting for both of you. But in particular, Glenn, you've worked with coal dust, mm -hmm. and Theaster, you work with tar. Yeah. <laughs> Two yeah. materials that come out of our sense of industry and labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so could you both talk about both the origin, right, of mm -hmm. coming to these materials from mm -hmm. each of you, mm -hmm. and their meaning mm -hmm. in your work and in the world? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I came to coal dust um, sort of by accident um, or a roundabout way. I was making paintings that were using a text by James Baldwin, Stranger in the Village, or I was thinking of making paintings using Stranger in the Village. And Baldwin's essays written in the 50s, at the time he's living in Switzerland, he's working on the novel, and he finds himself in this small Swiss village uh, at the home of the like a chalet that his lover's parents own, and finds himself the only black person in this village. And the essay is about this encounter. What does it mean to be a stranger in the village, literally? But more generally, what does it mean to be a stranger in terms of having a different culture, being a black American in Europe, being estranged from America, 
because he's left America mm -hmm. uh, in, yeah. to write, you know, gone to Paris and now is in Switzerland. So that's what the essay is about. And when I was reading the essay, I realized that Baldwin, bec partially because he was trained as a preacher, you know, uh, his writing is very preacherly. It's very sort of beautifully wrought, dense, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> inspiring. It has these kind of rhetorical things that it, are in good preaching. Um, and so I wanted to make paintings that had the kind of density and weight of his words. Mm -hmm. And so it was a matter of finding that material. It wasn't just oil paint. It had to be something else. And I was working with a printer at the time, and he said, you know, well, Warhol, diamond dust paintings. And I thought, yes, 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 but Warhol's done that. Mm -hmm. It's not the right material. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, there's this other stuff, Magnum. What is it? Coal dust, he's, you know, I, even before I saw it, I knew that was it, mm -hmm. you know, because coal dust is literally a waste product from coal processing. And Baldwin, in a very famous interview, talks about uh, how the margins of the society, being placed on the margins of society, give you a unique perspective to see the society. So Baldwin's very interested in the margins. He saw it as a privileged place. He sort of lifted mm -hmm. the margins up. Mm -hmm. And so I thought materially, coal dust was the same thing if I could lift it into the space of art. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where it came from. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've been using it now for 20-something many, many years. 20 something yeah, years, yeah, right? Yeah. Key to your painting, right. key to your painting right. practice. Right. So good. Mm -hmm. the <laughs> You'd never heard that before. That's really good. Okay. I don't really have anything to say. <laughs> well, you have to tell us a little bit about Tar and yes. your father. Yeah, it's so important. so I, I think that, you know, when Glenn, when you started out talking about kind of the 60s guys, mm. um, I, I think a lot about painting and I think a lot about like uh, glazes as a potter. And, um, and I think a lot about labor. And I thought, well, there's nothing about my practice that would enter the genre of painting on the terms of painting. Mm -hmm. What could I mine from my life that would allow me to, as a laborer, suggest that my capacity to labor is equal to or better than a painter's capacity to paint? And so in a way, I was trying to um, make level mm -hmm. uh, my history of a kind of uh, lack of discipline in the arts, but my huge discipline in labor. And then say that there might be a way that the value of labor could be equal to as beautiful, as uh, 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 provocative as um, what one might say in a what we understand as painting. So I started thinking about the rules of roofing. Like, uh, so my dad was a roofer. And uh, in my youth, I had to get on top of buildings in the, in the summer, in between rains, because after it would rain, he would get a bunch of phone calls saying, I got a leak. And so it would be right after the rain, so it's hot and sticky. We'd be on top of a roof. And my dad would say, you know, there's a very big mop. You dip the mop in this hot tar. The mop is very heavy when you dip it, maybe 50 pounds. And so you have to use your whole body in order to move this mop. If you put the mop on the roof and you leave it in one place, the, it starts to pool. And so my dad, from, when, I, when the mop stick was bigger than me, um, I developed a sense of like a swordsmanship or calligraphy or it felt like a dance that my dad would do with this mop because he was quickly trying to move tar from one place to another. He was not thinking of himself as a dancer on the roof. But there was something very elegant that as I got older and started to think about action painting or people who I admired in these other worlds, I was left to also think about my dad. So I thought, could, could roofing, in a way, become my ele elevated practice? And in that way, could I start to talk about these very personal narratives, this really uh, obscure, uh, marginal material, especially to, to, to uh, uh, more traditional time, kinds of arts, but, but could it actually do something that painting might aspire to? And so I found myself really uh, not only thinking about tar, but about the vocation of roofing, 
Like, is there something within the language and in the vocabulary of roofing that would offer me something special as an artist that I might add to the canon of the visual arts? And, and so I kind of just leaned into the material. I know more about roofing than I did when I was younger, but that's because I'm treating roofing as a kind of disciplinary practice now, not just as a labor, uh, a, a kind of means to an end. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, you're also incorporating the idea of labor. Absolutely. Right? into yes. the practice that you're doing as a whole. Absolutely, so I, I think that in many ways, it's all an attempt to kind of reclaim those things that um, the world might teach you are actually lowly mm -hmm. and making them the kind of elevated thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that idea that la labor or the labor and discipline that came from learning to do this thing might actually be uh, of great consequence, not only to me and my artistic career, but um, kind of this moment in contemporary art. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting. Mm -hmm. To position both of you within this moment, you know, there are many ways that in the kind of global contemporary art world that we can understand different art, different artists, the many dialogues that are happening. Is there a way, do you see your work in the context of either place, where mm -hmm. you are making your work, mm -hmm. time, this time period, or one before it? or just through the ideas itself. How, how, what I'm really saying to you as a curator, you know, as curators, we mm -hmm. often write the history of art, right? And put mm -hmm. artists in it in certain places. How would you write yourself and your practice into yeah. a current history? Interesting. Um, well, one of the things that's been curious to me is if you have a career that's long enough, work starts to change its meaning. Mm -hmm. So the image of hands, which will come up eventually, mm -hmm. is a piece that I made 20 years ago. And it is this you know, moment of testimony, visibility. But in the context of current US social history, that gesture of the raised hands has taken on a new meaning mm -hmm. because of various police shootings and the protests around those. And so I'm doing a show uh, in a couple of weeks where I'm going to bring that painting into the show. Um, to say two things. One is that the moment that we're in now in terms of our, the relationship of the public to the police mm -hmm. uh, is an ongoing issue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as part of what the march in Washington 20 years ago was about. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to think of these things not as things that just come up and we need to respond to as artists, but things we've always been responding mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. um, but also to think about you know, the, the larger kind of issues, mm -hmm. which I guess have always been in my work about this question of visibility and invisibility mm -hmm. and how, you know, for, for lots of different groups, but for me, particularly African-Americans, there has always been this tension about our place in, in the, you know, in the U.S. Um, so that's, but that doesn't quite answer your right. question. Right. But um, so I think, you know, the most interesting thing to think for me is when young artists are interested in the work, mm -hmm. which means that things that I've been thinking about still have a kind of resonance for them. Mm -hmm and have a kind of utility and they can move other mm -hmm. places from them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's, you know, not necessarily about art history, it's about a kind of, I want the work to be generous. Right. Mm -hmm. you but know? And if it still speaks, then I realize, oh, it has been generous right. in a certain kind of way. Well, I think you're speaking to the idea that the work from a particular moment can have re relevance right. and to artists. I mean, I think we all felt that mm -hmm. on the occasion of seeing your retrospective at mm -hmm. the Whitney, right? Mm -hmm. And looking over your over 25 year career mm -hmm. um, and seeing the way in which works that you made very early in your career, very specifically and thinking of those moments, the late 80s, early 90s, and mm -hmm. all of the issues and concerns that were informing the way we understood contemporary art, mm -hmm. but to see that work than a few years ago and its relevance, right? To not mm. just a social dialogue, but an art historical dialogue, right? right? Just right. to see the trajectory of truly your very particular mm -hmm. um, but very important and significant shift 
in the way we talk about painting mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. traced through that exhibition. So I think that's what maybe mm -hmm. in saying how you think of your relevance, that that might be a way to consider it. How do you think, particularly because, you know, at the Aster, your practice, as you said, exists in these three buckets. But there's one aspect of your practice that for some people, they might not understand as art. And yeah. that is the work that you do with physical spaces, mm -hmm. right, with buildings. Right. And in some ways, I would love for you to answer this question of where you see the work situated within an art history, particularly given the fact that some of your work, what will live in the world, mm -hmm. are these buildings in Chicago. And if you might describe a little bit about the Dorchester Project sure. and what that means to your work. Right on. So, um, so Glenn has also mapped out that there might be a relationship between relevance to younger people, to mm -hmm. different generations, relevance and generosity. That, that I think that um, artists may all have that burden, but I think especially in the States, black artists carry this burden of like, the work has to not only mean what it means, it has to mean all these other things. Um, there are definitely moments when I'm making a work of art, when I think I'm making this for myself, I'm making this for my history with my family, and I'm making it as a demonstration of a kind of work that might be made. That in fact, there might be works that I actually don't wanna make, but I will make it because it feels like the demonstration of a kind of work is important for other people, mm -hmm. right? So, so I feel like in some ways, I'm, I don't even think that I'm always engaged, like say someone needs, like you'll say from time to time, Thalma, somebody needs to curate that show. There are times that I'll make that work because I just think that kind of work, that moment needs to be accounted for in this, in this moment. Mm -hmm. So I have that burden, mm -hmm. maybe more than some, to, to not only imagine um, the internal work of um, the gift of being an artist and the burden of being an artist, but there's also a kind of gross external work that I feel like is, is related to um, why a person is put on earth. Like, it's like, I know that part of my job on earth is to make art, but another part of it has to do with the transformation of neighborhoods. And that transformation, we see it happening all the time by large multinational corporations that can acquire large tracts of real estate. I'm not actually talking about that. I'm talking about the kind of um, reinvestment that happens in poor neighborhoods by the neighbors who decide um, uh, we're gonna take care of our neighborhood ourselves and, and the governmental intervention that we've been waiting for that may or may not come, we don't wanna wait. And so that work also of like mowing the lawn, sweeping the steps, helping your neighbors paint a, a, a porch, that, that kind of everyday normal work, it feels both like a political gesture, like this is the highest work I can do and just a personal commitment to a place, so I think that Dorchester, where I live, it's become a kind of testament to what happens when normal, everyday people put their little cash together and try to do things, and I, I feel like that's especially poignant here in Madrid, where um, uh, Madrid, uh, not unlike other cities around, around the world, um, struggle with um, an amazingly talented, creative group of people who don't have jobs. And I think about unemployment in my hood, and I think, wow, you know, there are things that we can do when we're unemployed to make money. Those things aren't always legal. Those things, don't, they don't always make sense within a particular kind of framework. So what are the alternatives to those things mm -hmm. when you're trying to be like a good and just and creative people? Mm -hmm. And you can't buy paints, and you can't buy paintbrushes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like constantly asking that question of, so then what are the alternatives creatively that would allow me to feel like I'm contributing to the world in a, in a good way. And so I think that the work is born out of that. It's born out of really humble materials. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that it's both the creation of work, but, it, but then also the demonstration of what's possible mm -hmm. that drives me. Mm -hmm. And I hope that in the future, you know, why that seems relevant is, is that I think we're not in a moment where one can just think about art mm -hmm. and not think about the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's that tension between uh, the possibilities within art, but also the possibility that art could be one of the solutions mm -hmm. 
as weird as that might sound, and it's not everybody's deal, that art might actually offer a way different from other ways mm -hmm. that could be quite productive mm -hmm. in culture. Mm -hmm. And do you think, as we are in the 21st century, that this is a definition of an artist in the 21st century, that acknowledgement of the place of art, not just in the world of art, but in the world itself? That, that you, in some ways, are marking a path of how an artist might work and live differently, but in response to the needs and conditions of the moment. Yes, yes, but I also think that the conversation isn't just about what artists can do. Mm -hmm. It happens that artists might lead the conversation mm -hmm. about how the world could be more engaged yeah. with itself, mm -hmm. but this is also for the banker and the accountant and the mm -hmm. civil engineer, that wherever we are in our vocations, there's the possibility that the world needs more of us mm -hmm. than just what our nine to five needs from us. Mm -hmm. And that if there's not a willingness to at least distribute our capacity, if not our resources, our capacity, then we'll find that there's kind of greater and greater chasms mm -hmm. between those that have a lot and those that don't have so much. Mm -hmm. Glenn, what's the role of beauty in your work? Mm. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess beauty is always a kind of way to draw people into the issues the work is about. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I often say this, and I, I kind of mean it seriously, that it's very easy to make a beautiful thing, you know, and I, and I or it's easy for me. You know? um, oh, no, but I mean that cold dust in and of itself mm -hmm. is a very beautiful material mm -hmm. and that's what's interesting mm -hmm. to me because it is this waste product. So looking at the surface of these paintings and let me apologize, I was saying, oh you'll see images yeah, no, coming up and the still. images are, but on our screens yeah, here the slideshow is still yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. Ignore that. <laughs> so I'm going to ignore that, yes. Ignore that. Uh, but in terms of the materials, or the formal issues in the work, beauty is a huge important part because often I find that um, it's a way to get people engaged with things they wouldn't be engaged in, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I remember uh, I did a very big installation using Robert Maplethorpe's photographs of black men and this installation had many, many texts that had to be read in order to understand the piece. And one critic said that I was a closet formalist when he looked at the piece, which is ironic given Maplethorpe's images of, you know, homoerotic images of black men, so closet formalist. Um, but what he, I think what he meant was, I, or, or what I choose to think he meant, was that he was surprised that I could do something with that had a kind of social content, mm -hmm. but also was formally rigorous, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, and somehow those things were separated for him, but they aren't separated from it. They're, mm -hmm. the, they're a way to engage people, exactly. you know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Theaster, mm -hmm. what is the role of truth in mm -hmm. your work? Mm -hmm. Truth. Well, the beauty one is actually, in some ways, related to truth. Mm -hmm that, that um, when I think about a public housing, mm -hmm. in, in Europe, they, in, in London, they call it council housing. Folk who have housing needs and then the, the government tries to respond to that. Often, um, when we think about poverty, we think about it in terms of like, um, there's this basic need and we should solve it for as many people as possible. But the possibility that built within that basic need that truth, mm -hmm. that, that, there, that people should care for the needs mm -hmm. of the poor, mm -hmm. that we would kind of exempt beauty from truth, uh, abhors me. Mm -hmm. that, that we would imagine that, that, um, that a building, no matter what price it's built at, couldn't have inherent beauty in it, or a kind of inherent truth, and that truth be related to the thoughtfulness around how people live, or the dignity around how people live. Um, it, it means that someone hasn't done all the math, right. or that there were people left from the table that should have been at the table. Right. And so I think that in some ways, my projects have tried to keep those things well connected. Mm -hmm. That, that, that um, one can't have truth fully without um, observing how important the quality of life is, 
um, the, the possibility of um, something poetic happening in truth. And I think that it's that poetry, which could be the poetry of limestone or the poetry of marble or the poetry of a, of a very uh, uh, rare wood, mm -hmm. but it could also be the poetry of pine or the poetry of twigs, mm -hmm. that, that it really isn't, rele it's, not, it's not relegated to a kind of material, it's just, and I'm looking at Michael ar around this, it's really like how one uses whatever one has mm -hmm. to make the most beautiful and poetic moments possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a kind of truth in that, mm -hmm. in that there is a problem of housing, there's a problem of violence, but, but the difference between me and another kind of um, public official might be, I want to solve that problem beautifully as well as truthfully, mm -hmm. not just pragmatically, mm -hmm. that, that, that there's a lot of room mm -hmm. in there mm -hmm. for more. Right. And the room and the space for that narrative is created with art. That's right. right. That that's, that's I think that's how artists are right. different mm -hmm. from other kinds of people who have to solve very, very hard problems. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're looking at deficits that are in the trillions of dollars mm -hmm. and you're thinking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that need to be housed, and you think, well, how can we do that? Mm -hmm. And then you watch squatters do it beautifully, mm -hmm. do it elegantly, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, wow, there, there are ways in which um, the world wants for itself dignity. Mm -hmm. All people want a kind of dignity, mm -hmm. and it's just like, how do you get to it? And I think that that's a kind of artistic question. Right, that you can ask. I'm gonna ask if there are any questions for these two gentlemen here. There is, uh, is there a microphone or, or should we just? Yeah, okay. Because I think there's one here and then one over there. Please. Yeah. But we're waiting for the microphone. Please. Yeah, we can hear her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coast mm -hmm. and some places in, in the Caribbean coast, um, the culture um, moves towards uh, day life, the food, the music, and uh, coming back to the beauty. When I see these oh, cultural cultural expressions, it's like um, their history uh, has so many painful chapters mm -hmm. that they try to become all that, all the pain into beauty, mm -hmm. into joy. Mm -hmm. So from this um, uh, painful event like discrimination or all this, they um, transform it into a dance or um, a theater or a play for, for them. So that changed the meaning of this event, of this uh, historic, historical moment. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to ask if it's beauty, not in the way, uh, the aesthetic way, um, is part of your um, work, but as um, a way to transform that event or that um, character yeah. that mm -hmm. can have mm -hmm. yeah. this Beautiful. historical yeah. fact. Great mm -hmm. question. Beautifully asked. I was reminded of, um, there's an essay by Ralph Ellison on the blues, that music, and he says that the blues is personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. So the idea mm -hmm. of trauma, mm -hmm. loss, okay. you know, but expressed in this form, that's fantastic to hear, you know, that's beautiful music. And so those th things are always together. I mean, like it's a very perceptive kind of framing of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Using beauty to sort of change and transcend. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it also <laughs> felt like in your, in your question, there's this word beauty, but then under that is like to suffer. That, that, that in, the, in the same way that we think of other kinds of sufferings mm -hmm. that end up having um, a poetic consequence. I think that we're all, uh, 
that, that I'm thinking of, uh, say, Anselm Kiefer's work or parts of the history of Kara Walker's work, that, that there are these moments where the, the catastrophe is evident, but then there are other kinds of work that refuse to evidence the catastrophe itself. They say, uh, I'm not gonna show a lynch scene. I'm going to show uh, the tree and the people in the absence of the lynched person. And that there's something also in these apps, the, the resistance to over acknowledging the catastrophe, mm -hmm. like a, 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 that, that starts to create resistance and resilience, that it's, it's in there, but, but inside you're already doing the work of converting. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that in that converting work, you're acknowledging. Exactly. You're acknowledging suffering, you're, you're acknowledging the catastrophe, but it's also like you're overcoming. And, and I think that that tension between catastrophe and overcoming is really important. Yeah, fantastic. There's another question over here. Is, can we get the microphones coming to you across? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here. This is so exciting to see your faces and to hear you talk about your work. Um, I actually have two questions. I'll mm -hmm. try to make them brief. But mm -hmm. the first one has to do with this idea of visibility and invisibility that we seem to be talking about or you can seem to be struggling with or finding a way to overcome in your art. So I guess my question, and I ask this myself, so to be fair, um, is this idea of what is it about racism that renders us invisible as black people? What, what is the impetus of that? Is it the idea to um, cover up the catastrophe and the trauma that created the community of African American people in the United States? Uh, it's just a question I'm asking myself and I feel like in the work that you do, Maybe you don't have a specific answer, but something about the way that you express your work or the way that you work is an answer to that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's it. I mean, I would say as a curator who has been sort of committed to the presentation of artworks that explore these issues, that actually the invisibility and visibility stand side by side, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That there's, on the one hand, sometimes a, a lack of acknowledgement of the broad and deep history, which creates an invisibility, but then there's also a hyper-visibility, right. right, that's right. created through the way in which our histories play out. So that they're actually, this isn't an opposition as much as it's sort of two experiences happening at the very same time. And for me, as a curator, what has made art always so important to me personally, but also really important to me professionally, right, in the space of making exhibitions, mm -hmm. is the fact that artists, these two artists and, and many more, actually are able to allow us to understand the complexity of those two conditions through the work itself, right? So it asks as many questions about that that provide us with the possibility to sort of understand it as the work's answer. And that's what I think makes, for me, the way in which art can be our way into the complex questions that history and life and identity and culture ask, how we can answer them. Thanks. I thought also the Aster uh, was talking about value, and it was really it struck me that so much of his practice, mm -hmm. you know, roofing the value of labor, uh, the value of archives that are need to be dusted off and represented, and then people offering you archives because they suddenly realize, oh, there's this artist who knows how to do this, how to make these things visible, how to, you know, sort of raise their value, but also working in a neighborhood, too. I mean, Dorchester, if people don't know Chicago, is a very disenfranchised neighborhood. So to be there, to you know, and sort of do that gesture of like, city garbage truck isn't coming today, I'm going to sweep, you know, because this neighborhood has value, you know, like tied in with questions of visibility and invisibility, you know, but really it just struck me when he was talking about, you know, this question of value kind of comes into these, these questions of visibility. <coughs> um, my second question 
is actually related to the Dorchester project. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping, Glenn, maybe you could speak a little bit more specifically. Um, I was just really struck by, sorry, I'm gonna look at my notes, um, by what you said about uh, sort of creating alternatives to disenfranchisement or the way that art can be a, a, a way out and thinking about the situation in Spain in terms of so many people being disenfranchised from work and from maybe a way of life that they had once had. I, I don't know, I just wanted to hear some more specific examples about what you're doing in the community and, and how that plays out. Um, so I'll kind of relate this to also racism and kind of learning from others. Um, when, I, when I got to a certain point in my ceramics uh, learning, uh, my instructor said that I needed to go to Japan. So I went to Japan to this small town, Tokonami. And Tokonami is just a small industrial town and just outside the town are um, uh, very poor Japanese people who um, uh, manage to grow their own vegetables and they manage these uh, rice paddies. Um, when I was biking through this countryside, uh, I was really struck at how beautiful the architecture was. Traditional Japanese vernacular architecture, wooden structures, shacks. Um, and I thought that I was in the middle of a kind of middle class, uh, provincial Japan, when in fact I was in uh, dirt bucket poor uh, folk who were growing food because they needed to eat it. And if there was any excess, they could sell it a little bit. Um, when I started to get to know people in this area, what I realized was that um, the way that they viewed their lives was not in terms of fiscal aspiration, but, but rather um, a, a kind of a deep understanding of the power of spirit inside of materials, inside the world, a kind of animist culture. And that as a result of a deep reverence for that, um, the way that they touched things, the way that they handled materials was very different. It was a very different mindset from, say, my mindset, which was like, you know, if the wood wasn't new or if it wasn't a particular type of wood, I wouldn't use it. But they were like, no, this wood has an errant quality too. We should exploit that. And so, so I, I mentioned that because I, I think that when I got back to the States, um, I started to think about my own history with poverty differently, my relationship to Mississippi differently. Like, I was like, wow, you know, their fish shack looks like my fish shack, but because it's in Japan, maybe I think this fish shack is a little cuter, when in fact it's just two <laughs> poor fish shacks. You know, and that, that as I started to kind of mine local things, I started thinking about like all of the amazing people in my neighborhood who were doing things, but, it, but, but I never gave it the same reverence and awe mm -hmm. as I did when I saw this other thing. So could I start to employ this idea of a kind of animism, this deep respect for things and maybe the God inside of things, that, that, that I would have more reverence than the thing itself might warrant? And that could that be a way of approaching art in a, in a more sophisticated way? Or could it be a way of approaching community redevelopment in that there's a two flat on the, on the block, it's an abandoned building, it has inherent value it has inherent value. It doesn't have market value, it has inherent value. If I could exploit the inherent value in the object, this house, and then use it for the highest purposes possible to keep an archive, to show some films, to feed some folk, to have a house that's a house for poetry, and all we do is read in it, have a, that, that there might be something worth mining. And that if I could concentrate on its inherent value, that maybe eventually its market value might shift. But even if it doesn't, could we all value things inherently rather than things market-based? And so that became a kind of way of working through uh, um, beauty, truth, aesthetics, community engagement, without it having to be those things, but just by saying things have value, let's find it. And sometimes you find it by like ripping off the dusty, ugly paneling, tearing up the nasty, pissy carpet, sweeping, 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 but doing everything you can to get to an inherent value. Um, and, I, and what I found is that the more you strip back, the more you find a beauty and a truth. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Behind you, yeah. Hi. Um, yes, I guess I should stand up. 
Uh, so I have a, a question that actually refers to something that has been mentioned during your conversation, which is the role of the 21st century artist and how he cannot, or he or she cannot ignore some of the current uh, uh, affairs that are affecting the world in general. I guess we would be talking about some type of artistic individual social responsibility or, um, but um, in a way there, this, this kind of uh, responsibility is always kind of forced into uh, minority groups like, you know, I'm a black man, I was uh, born and raised in Spain, I always get this question, how is it that you were born here? It's already in my introduction, mm -hmm. I have to explain myself all the time, I have to and then, you know, if you think of uh, anybody who goes to see a show, as soon as they see that the artist is black, there's all these projections in there. And it, it, it's already late because by, this, by the time an artist starts producing, he, there is already a conversation. How am I going to justify my work? Mm -hmm. how, am going, how am I going to, you know, uh, pretend that I know what I'm talking about or let them believe that I know what I'm talking about, you know? Um, so my question is, it, since, you know, by being black or being a woman or being, you know, of a minority, you're already kind of forced into becoming a militant. Are we missing, <laughs> um, are we missing the most intimate kind of black artists or minority, you know, or artists who, be, who just happen to belong to a minority that happens to be a current affair? Mm -hmm. Are we missing that internal world? And, and, and my question to, to both artists here would be, have you found yourself censoring your most intimate artists in the benefit of participating in the conversation and letting those external conversations dictate your art and your choices? Beautiful slide. Mm -hmm. mm. um, <laughs> well, I think in the end, um, That's, that's sort of what I talked about when I was talking about putting a piece from 20 years ago in a show now, is to say that the concerns that I have as an artist precede certain kinds of debate, you know, they're, or they are formed out of larger questions than the individual things that people think I need to respond to, i.e. Ferguson, you know. Uh, and so, um, but I understand there is this pressure to um, respond, and it does become stultifying. It becomes hard in the studio. It has. It's a. Um, but I think there are very. There's so many different levels of responding too. So I don't want to say that. I make work because I feel like I need to make something about this issue now because it's in the world. But I think those issues being in the world changes the work in some ways. You know, I think you different level. I don't know if I can say it, you know, sort of <coughs> clearly, but I think those issues in the world do change the work, change the direction of the work, change where you're looking at, you know. Um, yeah, for some reason, when you first started your question, I thought about um, uh, um, Joan Baez uh, choosing to join particular protest moments and offer her voice uh, as part of a set of national voices. Um, thought about Paul Robeson, who you know, these moments, Fannie Lou Hamer, like folk who were in, uh, they were inside of their artistic sphere, which was completely, in a way, completely separate. There was nothing about that form over there that made them having a political voice relevant. And then for Muhammad Ali to say, I'm not gonna play. I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna take the draft. That, that those moments when an artist decides, black or otherwise, that there's a kind of, there's a kind of duty beyond their artistic duty to, to say something to the world. Those are really important and heroic moments. Um, and in, in this case, it's not always about what you make. It's sometimes about what you choose not to make. It's about 
a withdrawal that sometimes happens in the world, a non-participation, you know, like when Walid Rod says, I'm, I'm not gonna participate in this Biennale, you know, like those, those moments are, they're very important moments to me, but I think that there are also times when abstraction, or at least why I feel so akin to Glenn and why also I have an affinity towards certain moments is that, um, uh, the work also allows me the freedom to not have to play, do battle at such a low generic level of racism that, that, that actually the things that are on my mind are so much more complex than the kind of, um, the choice to disregard some people um, because of some systemic injustice. That actually I'm thinking about all these other ways in which the work might advance a set of things that I believe in. And sometimes those things are about um, my family, my people, that. But then there are times when the, the move forward has to be a much more complicated move that moves everybody forward. And so the, so the beauty of a, kind of, a certain kind of uh, gross artistic practice is that it's trying to do this with as wide a reach possible than, than like this. So I, Thing. And, and the, the challenge is always that when you do this, you want your people to know that you're also doing this, right? <laughs> like, you, you know, you don't, you don't want to, but you don't want this to, um, to make people feel like uh, they're not relevant. And so I, I think that there is this tension, um, but when I'm thinking about roofers, or when I, when I show this work, or when I made this work that used these um, uh, retired decommissioned fire hoses, that lots of different kinds of people have seen themselves on roofs and have, have used fire hoses or have known these hoses mm -hmm. or have complicated relationships with shine and shoes. It ain't just something that's like relegated to the black experience. And so when those people come and they want to give me a hug and they feel, I'm like, okay, fine, you can hug me too, it's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think your question really speaks to something that I think about a lot because the Studio Museum was founded in 1968 as a museum devoted to black artists. And this question, the struggle that you presented, was inherent to the mission of the museum to create the widest possibility for black artists to operate in many different ways, right? And for all of those to be relevant to art and to the culture. And you know, 46 years later, that continues to be our mission. But it's one that has to be continually thought about because there are many different ways in which an artist can exist as a creative visionary, but also as a citizen. And, and sometimes the times demand both in equal measure. And at other moments, artists can retreat. And that retreat is the most powerful thing they can do for the advancement of the culture itself. I think we have time for one more. One more question, right here in the middle. Could you pass down the mic to this gentleman? Thanks. Can, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. Uh, Theaster, I was thinking about your work, and particularly the, the work you are carrying in Dorchester. I was wondering how you feel that a specific practice that is inherently like long-term and involves an embedment in the place, no? How, because as far as I understand, uh, it's uh, like kind of a neighborhood artist, uh, specifically the part where you are developing the cooperative, pottery cooperative, you know, that has to have a function in itself, has to have a economical structure and to be like long-term. How do you feel it um, can still be breathing within institutional uh, and curatorial uh, 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 translation no, into the institution? So have you been like uh, somehow confronted to a demand to be like reproducing that kind of long-term mm -hmm. action into a kind of a more, uh, yeah, like a display uh, system? And then I was wondering that uh, the, the art object, what plays in, what is the role of the art object then in the, as a kind of a translation of those processes? And then my second question would be as well, how do you, um, get rid of the usual questioning that often happens in these kind of engaged processes uh, regarding the question of beautification, equal gentrification, or maybe uh, kind of uh, pushing into that undesirable direction in a neighborhood. Thank you. Wow. So 
this is where the rubber meets the road, in a way. Um, um, from studying urban planning, one of the things that was always really clear to me is that uh, neighborhoods change. Uh, they change for lots of different reasons. The neighborhood that I live in that is now all black, 30 years ago was largely Jewish, 40 years ago was 90% Jewish. The bank that I'm in the process of restoring, it was uh, a German-Irish bank, then a Jewish bank, then it was owned by the Nation of Islam, which is a black, uh, black Islamic regime or group. Um, and that now that the, the neighborhood has uh, less to offer, uh, it seems like it's the neighborhood for which everyone, if they can, they leave. They leave. Uh, and that leaving feels like a kind of erosion, like, a, like land erosion. Like the trees are gone, and because the trees are gone, the soil has nothing to hold on to. And so in some ways, I feel like this work I'm doing is it's not about the soil, it's about the tree planting. That there's a kind of, how can we create some kind of anchor moments that will be big enough symbolically in the world, in the city, in that neighborhood, and they have to operate at all these different levels. How can we plant these trees so that we at least start to stabilize the soil that is there? And, that, that, and then if the soil is stable, then leaves will come, they will compost, birds will shit, <coughs> things will grow, and, and that, that the kind of nutrient that happens only happens when you can start to stabilize certain things. Mm -hmm. So in one way that I think about Dorchester is it feels like tree planting. And um, I can't do everything, but I can plant some trees, and in, in this case the trees are um, 30 buildings uh, in a neighborhood that has uh, 7,500 buildings, uh, five commercial spaces in a neighborhood that has about 2,000 commercial spaces. And, and, uh, but these, these spaces that I'm creating, I'm trying to create them with enough poetic and symbolic potency that it actually feels like much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, because of where we are uh, in the city, like if this is the city center, we're like here, way out here. There's no threat of a certain kind of inevitable traditional gentrification because our city tends to gentrify in rings around really big trees that are already there. So there, there's some, some rings. But at least in this place, what I'm interested in is um, who might be attracted in staying, and as a result of staying, who might those people who are staying attract? So now that Thelma comes to visit my neighborhood, very nice Glenn come visit my neighborhood, that, that the neighborhood has a new, there are artists who are interested in being around. They don't necessarily want to live there, but they want to be around. And this is already a great, like uh, the bird who flies by and shits, this is like the people who come to me. Uh, that's a bad metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, but, but people do ask about gentrification a lot, mm -hmm. and I think that what that question what the word implies when people ask me often is, will you displace those who are already here with your art project? And uh, that would require that you understand the amount of gross um, blight and available land and abandoned buildings, the devastation that has happened from years and years of neglect. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, my alderman or my mayor would say, bring it on, free gentrification. But I think that there, but it's not just that. It's mm -hmm. not any kind of thing is okay here. Mm -hmm. It should be a, actually a curated, very intentional set of things. Mm -hmm. So that there are some things that are actually very needed, like we need a library. So it's like, well, let's build a library. We need healthy restaurants and grocery stores. So in some ways, I think the art is trying to get at a demonstration of what a small grocery store might look like, and then maybe a grocery store would be willing to move. So, so it, it's almost like if I, were, uh, if I were a grocery store maker, I would not move to this neighborhood to build my grocery store, right? And so grocery stores don't move there. But if I'm an artist who's making a political attempt at saying, how dare you grocery store not be here? 
<laughs> that then I can poetically create a, a grocery store that might actually turn into a real grocery store. And so that relationship between the symbolic and the real is very necessary, I think. And I think it's a thing that artists uh, in, in creative institutions can do better. Like, it's reasonable that the Rena Sophia could say, hey, Theaster, we want to commission you to <laughs> we, want to we want to commission you to create a grocery store on Dorchester. And then you can import your food to, to uh, our lunch. Fantastic. Yes. I have a question. Oh, please, Michael. Sorry, Jay. I see faster because I can't. Um, I'm curious about the campus. First, I want to thank you, three of you, who are friends. And I feel so honored that you would come to Spain and do this for us and for all these people because. I get to share your experience and your life force all the time, and I feel so incredibly honored to have you here. Um, it's a joy for all of us, and it's extraordinary conversation and really powerful. Uh, my question is, you all carry a lot of weight and a lot of sense of responsibility, both social and personal. <clears throat> What's next? Who's behind you? Is Dorchester, are there, you said the artist, are there people who are behind you? Are there people who are gonna continue the message that is not just of this time, but of the future. And do the artists behind you have the same feeling of responsibility and a, a burden almost to, to, to share this experience? And is it, or, or is, it, is it diluting because it's better? Is it cathartic because it's better? Or is it the same? Are they just as potent and just as powerful and impactful behind you? I think it's interesting to notice how many artists work collectively now. Um, young artists coming out of art schools who form these groups, which wasn't the norm when I was coming out of school. And so, and, and they come to form these groups because partially because they're interested in creating structures that uh, don't participate in the market in the ways that they're told they should participate, you know? Um, so I think that's actually very, given the market in the United States is very, large and hyped up, you know? I think it's, it's a really good sign that these young artists feel like they need a little space from that to create their work, and the sort of idea of these collectives is one way to do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting development, but. I love yeah. that. Well, mm -hmm. I, I do think that, you know, like I was commenting to Glenn uh, in the car over, that uh, the first time that I saw Glenn talk, uh, and the first time that I met him was really as, uh, inspiring, uh, aspiring, and that uh, it was the first time that I had met a, an artist of such public renown, and he was in this little classroom at the University of Chicago giving this talk, and it was like he was so much smarter than anybody else in the room, and it made me want to like read more and write more and and be a better artist in a way. And so I think that, that uh, in some ways, one never knows the consequence of their engagement with the world. I mean, we have a staff. I think my staff will perpetuate these ideas. We have, but I also think that there are those chance encounters. And so what I've tried to commit to is continuing to make room for chance encounters and for public conversations and, and for mentorship and all those things. But also I feel like when I talk to Glenn, I actually still feel like a student. And, uh, and, and the, the uh, you, know, you know, the, you know, it's kind of a, an honor to, to do this. So I, I think it's really important that we not get so, so separate from the rest of the world that the world can't feel the presence of the power because I actually think that that is part of the generative work. And I think the answer is yes, there are. There are artists, there are curators, there are institutions that are all forming themselves in new ways to think about the way in which art, artist, object, and audience can all have a different relationship to each other and to themselves and to the world. And I think for many of us, it really is not just our purpose, but it's really the privilege of the possibility that this is possible. So I think the answer is yes. And on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you all, Ambassador Costos, Mr. Smith, Virginia Shore Art and Embassies, all of your colleagues from the embassy here and the Reina Sophia for having us, because really, in many ways, this is 
This is the work we do, but it's also about a life of living in the world now, kind of representing the possibility, right, of what our culture, our history is, and how through art we can be in the world. And I know for all of us, we take that responsibility really seriously, but also really are grateful for the opportunity to kind of live within the space of our art and our work. So thank you, thank you to all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. You're fantastic. Thank you. Unhook yourself.